Welcome to RCR Wireless News. I'm Martha DeGrasse, and our topic for today is strategies for effective Wi-Fi offloading. I'd like to introduce you to your panelists for today. John Schneep is Senior Vice President for Product Management at Republic Wireless. John, thanks so much for being part of our webinar today. Happy to be here. Thank you, Martha. Monica Paolini is founder of Sensafili Consulting and is our analyst today. Monica, thanks very much for joining us from Europe today. Thank you for inviting me. Robert Gazda is Senior Director for Technology Development at Interdigital Communications. Robert, we're so glad you could be on the webinar today. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Interdigital is one of our sponsors today. Our other sponsor is Ixia, and we're joined by Sean Bioni, Wi-Fi Business Development. Sean, thanks very much for being on the webinar. Thank you, Martha. It's fantastic to be here. We're looking forward to it. And I'm Martha DeGrasse, editor with RCR Wireless News. A quick word about RCR Wireless News. We are a premier news source for the wireless communications industry. We try to provide carrier, network, device, test and measurement, and telecom software news. Follow us on the web at rcrwireless.com and on Twitter at RCR Wireless News. I'd also like to direct your attention to a feature report publishing today on our website on Wi-Fi offloading. Key takeaways from this report. Mobile operators are offloading traffic to Wi-Fi in order to make more efficient use of the macro network, but so far they are typically not charging for time spent on Wi-Fi. The vast majority of Wi-Fi access points are defined as untrusted. They are not carrier owned or operated. 802.11ac is driving a major Wi-Fi refresh cycle for enterprises and consumers. Some 802.11ac access points and routers support Hotspot 2.0, which does enable seamless handoffs from cellular networks. Service providers and equipment makers are exploring LTE in the 5 gigahertz band. This is the same band that 802.11ac uses, and we're going to talk more about that as we get into the webinar. I'd also like to point out some statistics on the growth of Wi-Fi offload. We thought this was a particularly interesting graphic that shows how much traffic is going from mobile devices to, to Wi-Fi. It's kind of unfortunate that, that Cisco made all the bars on here blue. It's a little bit hard to see, but if you look at that third blue bar, it's almost nothing last year. It's just a sliver this year, and then it's up to 21% of traffic by 2019. It's also important to note that still the vast majority of Wi-Fi is in people's homes or small businesses. So that reminds us that while we're talking today about carrier-driven Wi-Fi offload primarily, the vast majority of Wi-Fi offload is still user-driven. As users, we make the decision to move our devices from the cellular to the Wi-Fi network. Now at this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to our analyst, Monica Paolini of Sensafili Consulting. Monica? Uh, so I'm going to talk about Wi-Fi offload, and I'll talk about the balancing act because the, the question, what I would like to uh, briefly talk about is uh, how you mix Wi-Fi and uh, cellular. Next slide, please. Um, next, okay. Um, so first of all, we often tend to try to justify what do we need Wi-Fi offload and uh, uh, is it good or not? And I think that Wi-Fi is more than an offload. It, it really is the dominating uh, interface for uh, IP traffic in general and on mobile devices in particular. So most of the traffic that you see in a, um, in a, in, in a mobile device, uh, it, it actually goes through Wi-Fi. So in that sense, Wi-Fi has been sort of a free ride for mobile operators. It really helped them build the, the usage case, the, the, uh, the, the, the way we got used to broadband over wireless has been through Wi-Fi, not through cellular. So in a way, Wi-Fi is the, uh, the main interface for wireless access. So uh, it, it, is a, a, it is crucial for, for mobile operators. It's not really a choice. It's just a matter of life today to use Wi-Fi. But as Martha pointed out, still there is little traffic that comes from career Wi-Fi. Mostly it's from home and the enterprise. But career Wi-Fi is the logical uh, expansion that allows operators to use Wi-Fi more effectively. And, and so the, the trend is clear. But the question is not whether there should be or not, is how far to go in terms of the integration of uh, cellular and Wi-Fi. Uh, today, the two networks exist in uh, pretty much in separation. And uh, um, the, the question is, how much do you want to go in terms of having the two networks fully integrated? And uh, uh, 
if you integrate, as the, the picture shows, uh, you have to put a lot of effort. Uh, it's, a, it, it, it's somewhat expensive, but you have a higher efficient uh, of uh, the spectrum and more control over the quality of experience. And uh, my argument is that, yes, you do want to go uh, that, uh, that way uh, eventually. Uh, next slide. And uh, uh, one way to uh, address that is uh, uh, through uh, uh, LWA, which is a LTE and Wi-Fi aggregation. And here I'm just jumping on something very specific, but I trust that you have read or will read the excellent report from Marta, and uh, uh, that goes over all the, all the basics of uh, uh, Wi-Fi offload. Uh, LWA is something that I wanted to talk about because this is something that is very recent, gaining a lot of attention, and allows you to uh, integrate LTE and Wi-Fi in the RAN. So what Hotspots 2.0 or Passpoint do is to integrate Wi-Fi and uh, uh, cellular at, uh, 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 at the authentications from a user perspective, uh, a subscriber perspective. Here what you do is that you optimize the way you split traffic between the two interfaces and uh, the graph here shows you how how this is done, and it's in a way that it's uh, sim achieves a lot of the same benefits as um, of uh, LTE uh, unlicensed, uh, but doesn't need uh, to have a uh, new handset. So it, it's quite uh, um, it's quite interesting new development, and that's all for me. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Monica. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to John Schneep of Republic Wireless. Thanks, Martha. Um, I'll just give a quick, first of all, thank you for having us. Um, the public's really excited to be part of this with RCR, and thanks to InterDigital um, and the other sponsors. I, um, I'll give a quick overview of Republic, and then I'm looking forward to sharing some of the things that we've learned along the way. But Republic um, is a Wi-Fi first mobile carrier. Uh, we've been around since 2011. Um, we came out of beta in November of, of 2013, and we've been growing uh, really fast since. Um, and we've taken a lot of pride in, in, uh, in innovating in this category of Wi-Fi offload. So we were able to introduce seamless Wi-Fi handover to circuit switch cellular um, in our devices um, back in 2013. Um, we've been refining that experience since, um, and our customers have had really great experiences with that. Um, and our approach has been to uh, keep the experience very seamless for the customer. Um, and there, as, as I'm sure the folks uh, on the panel and in the audience know, that that can be pretty challenging to achieve that level of, of seamlessness. But our engineering team uh, and, our, and our entire Republic team have taken a lot of pride in that. And, and, and since, you know, we, we've... Um, We've grown uh, in the number of handsets that we offer, um, and our customer base is, is, is growing extraordinarily fast as we speak. Um, and we're continuing to put out uh, kind of new innovations in this category. Um, in fact, in, a, in, about, um, in about a month, we're going to open up our trial of, of handoff from cellular uh, circuit switch back to Wi-Fi. So um, new, new evolutions always coming, um, and um, Republic uh, is, is, is really, um, really pleased to be um, part of this, um, and uh, one of our core things that, that Republic is trying to do is use this technology, this innovative technology that we've developed um, to drive value for customers. So I think what you'll see if you go to republicwireless.com is uh, pretty aggressive um, care, uh, rate plans for customers. Um, we believe that that's part of our that's part of our mission here, not just to innovate and make the technology possible, but also to deliver value for customers along the way. So, um, so far so good. And uh, check us out at RepublicWireless.com. And uh, once again, happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that that innovation and those those good prices do go hand in hand. And we're looking forward to hearing some more from you later in the webinar, John. At this time, we're going to turn the presentation over to Bob Gosta of InterDigital. Hello, and it's uh, very, very good to be here today. Uh, you can move to the next slide, Mark. So here at InterDigital, we tend to view or focus on Wi-Fi offload from a, a wider context than just uh, simple cellular offload to Wi-Fi. And we look more at a, a ge more general context of integrating Wi-Fi and cellular networks together. We live very much in a world of network of networks, and how can Wi-Fi and cellular be used together to create a living, adaptable network? So if we take a step back and ask the basic question of why consider integrating Wi-Fi and cellular networks, and then take the viewpoint of both users and the network owners and the network providers. 
for, for users, it's really about ubiquitous network connectivity. Uh, as a user, I want to be connected to the right network at the right time in the right location that's providing the sufficient quality of experience that I need for my applications. I don't really want to be burdened with managing connections, knowing what network I'm connected to. My, my concern is my content and my services. At the same time, network providers are concerned with managing uh, coverage and congestion, uh, both within their singular networks, Wi-Fi and cellular, or in head net, head net, head nets. Uh, it's maximizing revenue, uh, gaining or retaining subscribers based on my own infrastructure and taking advantage of those of partners to increase my coverage and uh, minimize my congestion. And then also, Wi-Fi can provide cost savings compared to cellular. Uh, the last thing that we see is, is Wi-Fi can also provide interesting opportunities for new opportunities of, for services and for revenue. And just some examples could be uh, sponsored connectivity from uh, content providers or advertisers, uh, targeted advertising around locations, uh, upsell for premium uh, Wi-Fi in certain, in certain locations, and things like this. Now, one aspect is intelligent uh, traffic and network selection management. So if you can move to the next slide. Here, Martha, and how does that play a role? Uh, and here at InterDigital, we, we offer into this space what we call the, the Smart Access Manager. This is an intelligent network selection and traffic management solution that enables this heterogeneous living network, uh, enabling Wi-Fi and cellular integration. The Smart Access Manager, it, it's a downloadable or pre-installed client solution uh, supporting both Android and iOS platforms. Uh, we enable uh, Wi-Fi and cellular uh, network selection application traffic management, so it's about connecting to the right network in the right location, the right QoE, like I've mentioned before, but doing that uh, considering operator policies, uh, user preferences, the preferences of the user, um, network QoE, uh, QoE needs of applications, and what are the real-time conditions that the device is seeing. Now, the Smart Access Manager is based on the Access Network Discovery and Selection function, the ANDSF, coming out of the 3GPP. Uh, it can interface with a policy server that may be cloud deployed or, or embedded in an operator network. And it's about leveraging all available networks and then matching the right applications to those networks. So if you can move to the next slide, please. So I'll, I'll just uh, uh, summarize here of the benefits, the benefits of the Smart Access Manager and then maybe more generalized Wi-Fi cellular integration. So one is the enforcement of operator policies that are configurable and dynamic. Uh, it's providing visibility and network monitoring from the device. Uh, many times in het heterogeneous networks, uh, connectivity is going to be through untrusted, non-carrier controlled um, access, you know, accesses. How can, the, how can the carrier get uh, information about what the user and the device may be doing? User experience, it's the ubiquitous connectivity, seamless Wi-Fi authentication, QoE monitoring, and um, assurance. Uh, the Smart Access Manager is a standard compliance solution. So we're, we're based on ANDSF, also support Hotspot 2.0. We're IoT'd with multiple network, network partners providing economy of scale. And finally, like I mentioned earlier, we're supporting Android and iOS, both from a downloadable and a pre-installed client perspective. So th thank you very much for the, for the opportunity to speak here. Thank you very much, Bob. At this time, we're going to hear from Sean Bioni of Ixia. Sean? Thank you, Martha. Lots of you know Ixia as a market leader in uh, test tools, not only for Ethernet, LTE, and Wi-Fi, but also uh, security uh, appliances. And, and in the last few years, we've also um, gotten into the network uh, visibility market as well and, and are happy to be a leader there. Martha, please go to the next slide. I wanted to go ahead and predict the best practice for Wi-Fi offload. Um, as the market adopts multi-user MIMO, uh, this is going to have uh, tremendous benefits to uh, customers that access primarily on Wi-Fi. Uh, today, um, as you have an access point with uh, three or four spatial streams, uh, all those spatial streams talk to one device at a time. Well, multi-user MIMO is going to allow each spatial stream to communicate with a device so you can increase fourfold the number of customers that you'll be able to serve. This will dramatically increase throughput but it'll also help quality of service as well because you'll be able to take two spatial streams and perhaps focus on that device that's downloading video. So we're really excited to see uh, the benefits of multi-user MIMO. It's 
might, you might also hear about it as a 802.11 AC Wave 2. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more of a of a complex protocol for the for uh, the network equipment manufacturers to deliver. But uh, go ahead and go on the next slide, Martha. Uh, we're very happy that our carrier customers have adopted uh, new solutions to use in the lab so that they can pick the best possible vendors to put not only in their hotspots but in their customers' homes. So what we're helping the carriers do is to be able to see when, when you have multiple devices on a access point or gateway, when those devices are consuming high bandwidth applications like video, uh, it's very, very easy to have um, clean RF with low errors when you have one device connected for five minutes to an access point. When you have dozens of devices, like in a connected home, or perhaps hundreds of devices in a stadium or a public hotspot, you can easily see here on the bottom left that these access points can get out of spec very quickly and that they can have high transmit errors, uh, retransmissions, and really not able to provide the kind of quality uh, that customers um, ex expect. They just got off their cellular network, they had a great experience, they want to have that same experience on Wi-Fi. Next slide please, Martha. This is probably a much more easier uh, slide to consume. When the carriers take the time to put the right access points into their network, when they have access points with the highest uh, quality hardware, um, uh, when they uh, upgrade their networks with uh, firmware and software that is bug free, and when they have um, the highest possible uh, performing configuration, they're going to see fantastic increases in throughput as time goes on and as more customers connect to these uh, Wi-Fi hotspots. If they don't take that care, uh, they're going to have retransmits, they're going to have errors, they're going to have diminishing throughput. So we help our carrier customers put the best possible products into their Wi-Fi offload networks and into their customers' um, homes. Next slide, please, Martha. Ixia is also very excited to get into the network visibility space. Uh, we have a full array and suite of products. Now that we've helped you get the right uh, network equipment into the network, now we're going to help you to get maximum visibility so that you can have increased security, increased policy management, increased performance. We have several partners we work with in the space like Splunk and Wild Package, just to name a few. We're really excited about our network uh, visibility suite and um, taking that also into uh, virtualization performance as well. We have a tremendous, um, a, a tremendous uh, breadth of products that we can help our carrier customers with to see what's happening in their network, maximize application performance, maximize voice performance, and maximize security. So that's just a quick overview there. Okay, excellent, Sean. Thank you. We appreciate it. At this time, we're going to launch into our discussion. We will be on the lookout for questions from the audience, so if you have questions, please use your GoToWebinar control panel, and if we have time, we will try to get to those questions before the webinar ends. So we're going to start off by talking about public Wi-Fi, since that is the majority of all the Wi-Fi that customers are, are using. And uh, carriers need to offload traffic, but public Wi-Fi does run the gamut from very reliable to not reliable at all. So I think the, the first question for discussion is, can public Wi-Fi hotspots support carrier-driven Wi-Fi offload, or not just user-driven offload? And Monica, would you like to start us off on this? Yeah, uh, uh, here the thing to say is that Wi-Fi has really come a long way from the early days when it was really uh, you know, difficult to log in and to, to um, get associated to a uh, hotspot and uh, uh, the service was very uneven, the functionality was very uneven. Now uh, with uh, a hotspot 2.0 as pass point there is a, a very good framework that uh, the public hotspot can use to enable carriers to offer carrier grade uh, uh, services and uh, uh, at the same time uh, mobile operators can share their infrastructure so there is a very good uh, base uh, 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 at the core of Wi-Fi that enables everybody to use everybody else's network in a transparent way so that the users don't need to know they can just go and get connected and that's uh, that's really huge because you want to get connected you don't want to spend too much time trying to figure out what network is secure or uh, is accessible to use. Okay, and John, you're certainly taking advantage, I think, of a lot of public Wi-Fi. Do you have any perspective to add here? Yeah, I think the things that I would add to what, what Monica said is that um, agree that you know Wi-Fi has come a long way, and that the, uh, public hotspots are easier than they've ever been to uh, 
to get access to, and, and the quality of those networks has, has, has never been better. But I think, um, you know, from, from Republic's perspective, I think we still want to see, you know, that uptake of those standards like Hotspot 2.0 that Monica mentioned um, um, speed up on the user's behalf because I think, we, although we still see the majority of our offload going to the home and work Wi-Fi networks for our customers, um, we've done some tests and it's very clear that we'll see a material improvement when um, when customers are able to more easily access those public hotspots. Um, and I think that, that brings up another question I think that, that, that we've challenged our team to sort through and they've done a really good job thus far is that given the current status quo of Wi-Fi given that you know Sean mentioned earlier that there is there are some inconsistencies in quality that um, that you know, when when deployed correctly, you can um, you can fix through um, certain techniques. Um, but we've we've tried very hard to allow our devices to operate seamlessly under poor network conditions. So I think there there are ways to um, to to find a path through given the current state. Even though on the horizon are great standards that are going to make connecting uh, Wi-Fi even easier for customers and uh, and the quality to to improve, as, as Sean pointed out. Okay, great. Yeah, and, and I think that that as customers do start to see this more as just one experience, they're going to look to their mobile operator sometimes, even when they have a bad experience on Wi-Fi, if, if they think that the operator sent them to that Wi-Fi. So I think that operators are really interested in, in intelligent, secure offload to Wi-Fi, even if it's public Wi-Fi. Robert, what, Bob, what do you think about that? Well, the, the key words in, in this, this question are, are, are intelligent and, and secure. So if we're talking about public Wi-Fi, th this, is the, this is the untrusted Wi-Fi. This is Wi-Fi that the operator does not have direct, uh, con direct control over, nor do they have direct visibility. So two aspects uh, related to intelligence are monitoring the network quality, uh, monitoring the, network be uh, the user's behavior and their application behavior, uh, many times there's more than one Wi-Fi network uh, that would be available. So it's picking, you know, choosing choosing which network has the proper proper um, quality for what the user may uh, may be may be wanting or requesting. And then the other aspect is security, the secure. So security is going to depend on what types of services or content are getting offloaded. Uh, um, you know, internet, you know, over the top internet traffic may have very little security requirements. Uh, other services, such as voice over Wi-Fi, voice calling, uh, may have tighter security requirements. So if that, if that network is an untrusted network, uh, security will generally need to be provided via IPsec tunneling, VPN tunneling, back into the mobile core network to facilitate those services over this untrusted or, or um, open network. Now, I, you know, Passpoint will certainly be coming, right? So Hotspots 2.0 Passpoint networks are going to be coming more and more widespread. Uh, but that said, um, the open captive portal will be around for, for many years to come. So, so the, the public Wi-Fi is going to be a mix of secure networks with very unsecure networks, and that will need to be considered in the offload solution. Okay, now you, you talked a little bit about IPsec tunneling and then about Hotspot 2.0 and how that's going to facilitate everything, but can you just give a little bit more information for people who may not understand all that about how Hotspot 2.0 is going to simplify the process? Well, uh, Hotspot 2.0 provides two, two aspects. One is, uh, is roaming, uh, support for roaming. So behind Hotspot 2.0 is uh, EEP radius-based authentications uh, where a, uh, a network uh, a hotspot can be supporting more than one service provider behind it. Uh, also provides the ability to uh, facilitate roaming, roaming agreements amongst operators. Uh, where, you know, I may be connecting to a uh, one operator's access point, but I'm still authenticating back with my, uh, my home, right, my home operator. Uh, that's, that's one aspect, uh, the authentication piece. Uh, the other piece is security. So uh, Passpoint networks are encrypted, uh, right? They're encrypted networks that provide over-the-air security. Uh, most public Wi-Fi today um, is open captive portals. So they're un unencrypted, uh, open, open access sort of networks. Uh, and that's where the VPN IPsec tunneling will come into play. So if I'm running a voice service, I want that traffic to be uh, encrypted or, or other operator types of services. Uh, operator will want that traffic to be encrypted so it's not being um, 
uh, intercepted. Okay, great, Bob. Thank you very much for that explanation. And then we need to talk a little bit more about quality of service because uh, my service providers will want to know how those hotspots are performing and whether they want to continue to send people to those same hotspots over and over again. And Sean, I think that, that you've done some work in this area. Yeah, absolutely. So um, carriers are in a great position because not only are they deploying uh, their access point hotspots, but they also have control over the devices, the um, handsets, the tablets that they provide to their customers. So what we've been doing is working with the carriers in their, in their labs to ensure that the devices that they have um, to their customers work under the best possible conditions as the access points that they have deployed, maybe not only in the home as a gateway, but also um, you know, at stadiums or in public, um, in public uh, Wi-Fi hotspots. So being able to work with them in the lab to make sure that the configuration of not only uh, the client, but the access points and controllers are, are giving the highest performance, highest secure performance uh, possible. So I, I, but there's an old joke, right? Um, uh, to, a, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I mean, I, I'm an, we're a test tools company, and we believe that before you even measure in your live network, you should be taking that time in the lab to get the best possible access points, uh, the best possible client devices, the maximum configuration. Then once it's deployed in the live network, we can use our visibility tools to help carriers see if their voice performance, their VoIP performance um, has low jitter, has low packet loss, and if they are um, uh, getting statistics that show them that simply uh, there's too much packet loss, too much jitter, that the um, quality of experience is low for those customers, uh, being able to then access the tools to help them optimize uh, real time uh, that experience and improve performance. Okay, great. So given that, that carriers are starting to gain the tools to, to really optimize the experience on public Wi-Fi, and given that most carriers in the U.S. do not own and operate Wi-Fi networks, John, do you think that, that we're going to start to see mobile operators uh, forging more partnerships with Wi-Fi network operators? Yeah, I think, I think you'll see that, um, but I don't think it'll be a, the same for all mobile operators. I think, you know, some have made some investments. Not, not all have made the same amounts of investments in Wi-Fi networks. Um, AT&T certainly made a huge investment in Verizon to a lesser degree. Um, but I, I'll speak for Republic. Uh, in this world, you know, we, we believe that, you know, Wi-Fi wi is the primary network. Um, and to really achieve that for customers, our customers, um, we, are, we are having and continue to have these discussions with Wi-Fi network operators and cable operators um, to establish that seamless experience that, that folks have already referenced on the call. I think when we talk to our customers, they want Wi-Fi to work similar to how cellular works in the sense that they don't have to think about which hotspot they elect to, uh, to um, connect to. Um, and they certainly you know, don't want to bother about you know, QoS and um, packet loss latency and jitter and those things that the, the folks on the on, on our side, you know, watch in real time to make sure the quality stays high. So I think the net of it is th there'll be there'll be some mobile operators that will that will want to and have to partner up with cable operators to get uh, a great experience on Wi-Fi. But I don't, I don't think it'll be across the board. Okay, great. Well, we'll have to watch and, and see what happens there. All right, let's move on and talk now about uh, carrier Wi-Fi. Excuse me, I'm slides. Um, key characteristics of carrier-grade Wi-Fi networks. It's a term that we hear a lot, and uh, it is defined by the Wireless Broadband Alliance. Carrier-grade Wi-Fi networks are defined by the Wireless Broadband Alliance as those that enable at least one gig per second for 802.11ac. They enable handoff and seamless authentication across multiple Wi-Fi networks and to cellular networks. They offer roaming and a high level of security, and they can be managed by the carrier's OSS-BSS, which does require integration with the mobile core. 
Now, the term carrier-grade Wi-Fi uh, is, again, used in a lot of contexts, and many people will use it to mean not exactly that, but we thought it would be useful just to sort of get a definition out there that is sort of a reference point. Um, given that, how can service providers enable seamless handoffs to carrier-operated Wi-Fi networks? Bob? So the seamless handoff requires a, a, few, a few elements. Uh, the, the, the first one is, of course, selecting the network. Uh, so it, it's more than just the carrier's own network. Uh, there, the you know expectation is there's going to be partnerships of Wi-Fi networks. Um, so it's it, it's picking the right network uh, based on a preference ordering that may be coming from an operator policy, uh, based on quality uh, that's been seen in the Wi-Fi networks from an historical perspective, and then also the real-time conditions that would be seen at the device. Um, then there's of course seamless authentication. So getting the device connected to the network. Uh, seamlessly. Uh, this is where ANDSF, Hotspot 2.0 come in perspective. Uh, if we're talking about um, uh, mobile carriers, EPSIM, EPACA to authenticate those users on the Wi-Fi networks using their cellular cred credentials. Okay, now, great. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say now, uh, even though it's a carrier Wi-Fi, you still have questions of trusted versus untrusted. So a carrier Wi-Fi may be that of the home operator or it may be that of a roaming partner. So you still have questions around security and that even though it may be a secure network, uh, it still may not be the home operator's network. And the last interesting piece, and this only comes into play uh, depending on services, is, uh, is IP address uh, preservation, whether IP address preservation is needed. Uh, that would be important for a, a voice over Wi-Fi to a Volte handover. Uh, most internet services uh, tolerate IP address discontinuity, so that only comes into play for specialized services like, like voice over Wi-Fi or voice over LTE. Okay, great. And Bob, I think that you had wanted to also add some comments on what we were talking about on the last slide, I think maybe when John was talking. Oh, I just had a small comment on the um, the, the, the QOE, the Q, uh, um, quality of service monitoring for public right. Wi-Fi. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, uh, um, you know, since a public Wi-Fi is not under the operator's control, and 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 and, and Sean mentioned uh, mentioned this, is that that the, the device really comes into role, right? It comes into play. So the only way that that operator will have visibility is from the is from the client, uh, since that public Wi-Fi network is outside of their visibility. So intelligence on the client plus monitoring and reporting from the client are, are key aspects to managing quality of experience, quality of service over these public networks from a from an operator, uh, from an operator perspective. Okay, I great. Wanna, I also want to add to that the device is very important in this equation. Yeah. Um, you know, the, a lot of the intelligence of the 802.11 protocol is in the device's decision to roam or stay connected to an access point or to jump to another um, network. So customers who want a great experience really, you know, really need to understand that is the network important? Absolutely. You know, the network's important. The brand of the network is incredibly important. But the device is incredibly important if you want to have a great experience roaming, stay connected to a network when there's lots of traffic, lots of other devices around at a Starbucks. Uh, uh, much of this um, success is going to be picking an excellent device. Right, and we don't we don't see a lot of devices right now that have that have full support for for full seamless Wi-Fi handover, at least not voice over Wi-Fi, right? I believe that's the case. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about about cloud managed Wi-Fi. It, it seems like, as you were saying, a lot is on the device, and then um, a lot of what the what the carriers are looking for from the networks is going straight to the cloud. Do you see that trend continuing, Sean? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Can you ask the question again? Yeah, cloud cloud managed Wi-Fi for carriers. It seems like a, perhaps a lot of the the solutions that carriers are looking at to give them feedback from what's going on with these devices when they move to Wi-Fi are actually cloud-based solutions and are not necessarily sitting in their networks. And I'm wondering if you can comment on the, the advantages and or disadvantages of that. Oh my God, yes. Um, well, we're going to see continued adoption of uh, cloud-managed um, access points or, or taking the controller and putting it in the cloud. Uh, it's got incredible benefits uh, for responsiveness of how many devices um, are on your network, the allocation of bandwidth, uh, the allocation to um, applications like voice. 
uh, able to make uh, you know network wide changes very quickly in the cloud. Lots of reasons that the enterprise or even just personally um, we have a fast adoption to cloud services and not keeping everything localized. Uh, being able to back up quickly, being able to re, uh, reinstall a network backup in case anything were to go wrong. So we're just going to continue to see all of those benefits and more cloud adoption. The optimization tools that are plugged into the network come into play as well. Carriers have dozens of optimization tools, WAN optimization, security optimization. All of those tools are dynamically, real time, uh, trying to capture and make sense of all of the packets going through the network, all of the optimization of the applications that are being used in real time, and then also keeping that entire ecosystem secure. So I, I, I see just more adoption for cloud managed um, controllers, cloud managed access points. I'm not sure what the, what the downside is to that. I mean, I don't know if anybody else can comment on the downside, but no, I just see all upside with that. Okay, great. Does, does anybody have any concerns about possible downsides to cloud managed Wi-Fi? Okay, let's talk about monetization. Monica, do you think that traditional mobile operators will ever actually be able to charge customers for minutes spent on carrier-owned Wi-Fi? Um, yeah, this, this is an issue that comes up all the time, how to monetize Wi-Fi networks, and I think it's sort of the wrong question. Um, and this is because if you use a, a Wi-Fi offload with carrier Wi-Fi, you basically free up capacity on the macro. That's highly valuable to operators, so it's not a direct revenue from subscribers paying for Wi-Fi, but it's uh, revenues that operators can get from serving more um, cellular subscribers, so that that's uh, good. But in terms of really charging, can you charge somebody for using Wi-Fi? And uh, my answer is, you, you no, know, you cannot if you just say, I'm selling you Wi-Fi access, that has proven to be uh, very difficult. So because we, we used to have Wi-Fi for free, so we don't want to pay for it, but if you are look at uh, uh, service, we do pay for service, we accept that. So if instead of being sold as Wi-Fi, it's sold as part of the service, uh, then I don't see any po any problem when I'm uh, uh, out there doing something and watching a video, say, um, the fact that it goes through Wi-Fi or LTE, it's really of no relevance to me. It's a service that I really care about, and so I see no reason why they shouldn't be able to pay for it as long as I can provide the uh, you know, the good service that uh, subscribers expect. Okay, great. Anybody else have anything on, on charging for Wi-Fi or monetizing Wi-Fi? All right, let's move on and talk about voice over Wi-Fi. John, obviously uh, you're the expert here. H how do you see the, the proliferation of voice over Wi-Fi impacting Republic and other Wi-Fi first operators? Yeah, yeah, obviously this is something that we've, we've obviously thought about quite a bit at Republic, and I think first and foremost the fact that we're seeing a proliferation of voice over Wi-Fi offering is great. I think yeah, I think it, that's always made sense from a customer perspective that there would be a network there that you, you should be able to make use of. But I think as far as the Wi-Fi first operators, you can think of them in two kind of categories. One is a category that I think you know has built a real technical advantage that drives cost out of the system kind of to the, to the point Monica was making earlier. Um, and, and then there's others who are essentially uh, merchandising their approach that, um, that would favor a, a more Wi-Fi centric usage pattern, but does, they don't have a necessarily a lower cost structure than any others. So I think, I think as, you know, as the competition heats up in the mobile space, um, uh, will favor those um, Wi-Fi first operators who have a real technical advantage that drives costs out of the system. And I like to think, you know, Republic is certainly in that category, a leader in that category. Um, because I think um, the truth is uh, using more Wi-Fi does drive costs out of the system. And for Wi-Fi first operators, um, you can deliver that value to customers. And as I, as I said at the beginning of the call, that's a big part of what Republic has been trying to do from the beginning. So I think in general, when we think about the Wi-Fi first operators, this kind of those two categories emerge in my mind. Um, and so, so in the question kind of comes down to um, does voice over Wi-Fi when it's added, does it actually 
save customers money. So you've seen operators introduce voice over Wi-Fi as a feature, but not uh, not obviously not monetize it, but also uh, you know not reduce anybody's bills. Um, so we think it should reduce customers' bills. Um, and in the second, you know, the technology advantage that you have to build to, to meet customers' expectations in this regard uh, is a is a pretty high bar. I think this has been addressed already on on the call, but in general. The you know Wi-Fi will improve over time, but I think customers' real-world experience with Wi-Fi today is very consistent and solid on their home and Wi-Fi networks that they've been that they see very often. But it becomes varied and uh, inconsistent as they get outside of those kind of first two Wi-Fi experiences. So building a a technology foundation that allows your voice over Wi-Fi connection to be resilient to that uh, that kind of um, that heterogeneous, unpredictable quality network, I think, is 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 really critical for customers right now, um, and that's that's why um, we've spent so much time on on the Republic side engineering for sophisticated uh, handover timing al algorithms for our circuit switch fallback, um, and and we've experimented with with um, even uh, other technologies that I think we can address later in the in the in the conversation. Um, that allow customers to basically weather these m small pockets of bad quality or inconsistent packet delivery for voice over Wi-Fi um, and get the experience that they expect um, from their mobile from their mobile experience. Okay, great. And and you said that you haven't seen anybody using voice over Wi-Fi to reduce customers' bills, but but if a customer pays for a certain number of minutes on the cellular network but then chooses to use Voice over Wi-Fi a certain amount of time. Don't they enable themselves to to buy a, a lower plan or pay for fewer minutes? Yeah, I think so. I, I just don't. I, I don't think that's happening in mass. Um, okay. I think that's asking customers to do a lot of work. Okay. Um, to save your customers to save money, and I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I, I think it certainly does happen. There's customers out there who are, you know, downloading over the top apps and and using Wi-Fi to say buy a cheaper plan. Um, with their mobile operator, but I think primarily what that the onus is then put on the customer to you know get a second number, or do some configuration, or um, adopt some sort of non-native approach. Um, and I think you know the thing I would share with the audience is that we found the native approach to be absolutely critical to delivering on customers' expectations. So, you know what I mean by native approach is when they when they power on the phone and they dial. Whether they're in the presence of Wi-Fi or not, uh, it's it works just like any other experience that they're used to. They don't have to adopt a new uh, app or um, you know incoming calls come in this way, outgoing calls go out that way, or there's a whole second number to be concerned with. I think you know driving the value for customers is just as much about delivering the experience that they expect, one that's not different or compromised compared to what they're used to on the cellular side. Okay. Well, we've seen all the four major U.S. carriers say that they're going to support voice over Wi-Fi. Two, two are doing it so far, two are not. Bob, do you think that we'll see see it more as these networks get upgraded for Volte? Is, is voice over Wi-Fi the logical next step? I, I think that the, the general answer to that question is, is yes. Um, however, it, it's going to depend on the context of, of each of the individual operators. Uh, so, so John was mentioning uh, cost savings there. So Wi-Fi may have an overall cost savings uh, compared to the cellular, to LTE networks. And uh, that, that would apply both to voice and to data, right, to data services. Uh, but one of the interesting aspects that's being used for, for voice over Wi-Fi um, is the ability to extend voice coverage indoors or where an operator may be uh, 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 lacking uh, coverage gaps. So uh, they, uh, they do make that up now with Wi-Fi. So devices can get connected to Wi-Fi where they may have uh, gaps in cellular coverage. That covers them from a data perspective, but the operators are losing their voice service. So the voice over Wi-Fi will provide them that ability to extend that voice coverage down into those areas where they have coverage, coverage gaps. Uh, I think uh, another, you know, another area in this space is, is the handovers. So if you look at the carriers that are out there today, the ones that have voice over Wi-Fi deployed outside of Republic here, but the, the M&Os, 
uh, they don't support handover between Wi-Fi and cellular. Um, I think that's a limitation that also needs to be removed before there's like widespread user adoption. So that voice service just works no matter where they're connected. No matter where they're connected. Well, that that gets into you know rigorous testing and quality control. And Sean, you can speak to that. Absolutely. You know, um, it really dawned on me at CES this year as I was. Um, looking at all the connected cars uh, that there were on the floor, how important it was for the consumer to have not only a seamless experience with their device, but to have the same quality application experience in their home, in their car, on the train, at work, um, in a stadium. All of these scenarios were Wi-Fi first scenarios. I mean, um, I know in the car you're obviously connecting cellular, but the whole experience was to connect Wi-Fi to the connected car. Um, and then all the other scenarios, you're using your Wi-Fi in a train at a stadium, uh, at the enterprise, at home. Um, so your device was extremely important um, in this life, you know, um, life cycle of using your applications, voice applications, video applications, screen sharing applications, you, 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 I can't urge carriers enough to take the time not only to have a Wi-Fi offload strategy and um, provide their own Wi-Fi networks, uh, work with co co companies that are trying to monetize Wi-Fi, but also to take the care to offer the best possible devices to their customers and when I say the best possible devices, the best possible Wi-Fi experience, because the trend is obvious. Customers want to connect over Wi-Fi because it does save them money. So carriers, it's critical that carriers take the time to make sure the devices that they're offering their customers have the best possible Wi-Fi experience. John, why do you think there are so few handsets that currently support voice over Wi-Fi? Yeah, I think, I mean, we've, we've kind of lived this over the last couple of years, but it goes to what, what Sean was just alluding to, and, and as far as the quality of Wi-Fi hardware that's out there in the devices today. So I think from Republic's experience, we've been a little bit disappointed with the speed of uptake and of Wi-Fi uh, standards and uh, the latest Wi-Fi tech in handsets. Um, we'd like to see 802.11ac in all the phones. We'd like to see MU MIMO. We'd like to see... Um, even even um, you know deeper level um, integration between the chipset and the OS to handle real time voice over IP. Um, so we, we've kind of we've kind of plowed our way through this, and through that we've gained an understanding of kind of it really comes down to how the market works today. And I would say the reason we're not seeing uh, more handsets handset supported is really just a market forces type of thing, and it comes down to. Um, kind of aligning incentives uh, across the carrier, the uh, device manufacturer, and, and, and then obviously the customers. So um, we've, we've tried to achieve that through, um, like I've said earlier, delivering more value to customers through these lo lower priced plans. So when the customers come, and that gives us as a carrier um, a little more weight with the device manufacturers to say, okay, we want to see you know the latest Wi-Fi tech and the devices that we're going to field for our customers because our customers also care about it because it saves them money when they get higher quality Wi-Fi hardware in their hands. I think in general uh, that 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 all those dominoes haven't quite fallen in a, in a massive uh, way uh, at least in North America, uh, and that's that's why I think there hasn't been as many incentives for. Uh, uh, device manufacturers to push the latest Wi-Fi tech. In fact, you've seen the opposite. You've seen, you know, fast and aggressive adoption of the, you know, the cellular side of this of the equation. Um, and I think aligning the incentives is the key to making sure that uh, device manufacturers prioritize those those features in the phones that they offer. Right. Okay. Well, we'll have to see what happens there. So, all this is is really driving towards integration of of Wi-Fi and cellular from the user's perspective. Um, what are the most important user and business drivers to support seamless Wi-Fi cellular access? Monica? 
Well, I, I guess that it goes back to the fact that uh, when we have a device, most of us at least, um, we don't we don't care which interface uh, we're using, and uh, it's true many of us love to use Wi-Fi, but you really are trying to get a, a service, so you don't want to be uh, thinking of um, which interface to use. So it, it's still important for uh, for the users to be able to choose if they if they so desire. So um, to have the freedom to. Do, to do it manually, but it's really so much better in terms of uh, facilitating use uh, is to, to have a completely uh, transparent interface. Uh, on the uh, network side, from the operator viewpoint, uh, the ability to switch is, is quite important because you can uh, um, optimize the use of the network resources more effectively um, and also control the quality of experience. Uh, with 3G, it was we were in a situation pretty much all the time we were better off with Wi-Fi um, because uh, 3G was so limited in terms of capacity or is still, still so limited in terms of capacity um, but uh, with LTE now and with uh, Wi-Fi getting progressively I mean used more and more uh, in, in some situations you might be better off using LTE in some situations it's better, you're better off using Wi-Fi and as a user you don't want to be making that decision because it just requires a lot of time so uh, it's much better if the operator does uh, takes the right decision and it also takes the right decision in light of the entire network uh, um, experience so if everybody goes on to Wi-Fi as a, as, a, as a default then you're going to have congestion in Wi-Fi and the LTE network sit empty so that's not good either so you want uh, somebody to the, the operator to be uh, in charge uh, of assigning uh, subscribers to different uh, interfaces unless the subscriber wants to do otherwise for whatever reason. So it's uh, it's really a, a, you know a win-win situation where you remove that burden from the subscriber and uh, uh, it, it, it is done in an automated way that optimizes uh, the user network resources. So really the, the business case from the carrier's perspective is more efficient use of their network resources and, and the ability to support more subscribers really, right? Okay, um, let's move on to the technologies that will enable integration and or convergence. Bob? Okay, so on, on the technology front, uh, on on Wi-Fi, there's Passpoint, there's Hotspot 2.0, and, and, and also next generation hotspots, the, 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 the follow-on to the Hotspot 2.0 phase one. So that's going to enable uh, security, performance, and roaming, roaming from a Wi-Fi perspective. In the, the 3GPP, there's the access uh, network discovery selection function like I mentioned before. This is a policy framework on how to choose when to connect between Wi-Fi and cellular networks. Uh, these are standards-based technologies. Um, there are also many proprietary solutions, and these range a gamut from Wi-Fi management applications, there's policy clients, there's Wi-Fi aggregators, crowdsourcers, so there, there's many proprietary solutions. And, and what do we see today? The, the, the proprietary solutions are dominant in the market uh, at the current time, and, and that's because they're available. Uh, they can be deployed over the top. Uh, they don't provide all of the same uh, seamless connectivity, security, some of the other aspects and features as we've been discussing uh, discussing here in the webinar. But what we expect from, from the interdigital perspective is this is going to transition to uh, a standard solutions over the next uh, several years, one to two, one to two years. You're going to see Hotspot 2.0, uh, uh, NGH will be everywhere available on devices. Same thing with ANDSF. Uh, ANDSF will be uh, will be available in a native device sort of sort of perspective. And what what challenges do you see for the adoption and deployment? Uh, and you know uh, the, the biggest challenge now is the device penetration and availability. Yeah, right? everyone keeps saying that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, it, and it's especially uh, you know from the aspects that require the platform OEM integration. Now, now there's some aspects of Passpoint and ANDSF that can be deployed over the top. Uh, there's others that that cannot, and you know, for for better or for worse, the the OEM uh, cycles are you know they could they can be um, they can be long from these feature sorts of perspectives. So in the gap, like I mentioned before in the other question, the over the top client application uh, cloud based solutions are going to fill. Our opinion are going to fill this 
fill this gap. Um, yeah. Okay, we are almost out of time, but let's uh, let's move on and quickly talk about Wi-Fi as a service. And uh, it's interesting because we did have an audience question about DAS inside buildings and why people would use Wi-Fi when many buildings have perfectly good DAS. And I think a lot of cellular operators are used to thinking of, of DAS as a service, but um, I think perhaps more enterprises are more interested now or getting more interested in Wi-Fi as a service. Monica, what are you seeing? Um, well, you know, the, the, the two, the, the DAS and the Wi-Fi are very different because Wi-Fi typically is controlled by the enterprise and that's from the mobile operator. So you need both and they serve very different purpose. And uh, the same is, is true if and when or when you're going to have uh, small cells. Um, in, in terms of Wi-Fi, um, you know, uh, it really depends on how core it is uh, uh, Wi-Fi to the enterprise. So in some enterprises, um, Wi-Fi is a critical mission network. It's completely integrated. It's the dominant network in the enterprise. And uh, I can see that those uh, those enterprises want to keep retain control over the Wi-Fi networks. They might allow career Wi-Fi to sit along uh, in, uh, and operate in parallel to their Wi-Fi, internal Wi-Fi network. So for instance, for guests or for voice. Uh, because they don't want to have voice on their corporate network, most likely. Or in many cases, they don't want to. However, there are smaller uh, enterprises or enterprises that don't see Wi-Fi as a core part of their, uh, of their operations, and those might be interested in, uh, um, in having Wi-Fi as a service uh, and possibly to have that managed along with the DAS or small cells. So it really, it really depends. Same thing with the, in public venues. Um, if uh, Wi-Fi is seen as a sort of an optional service, uh, then they're more likely to uh, have an operator come in and take care of it. If it's really something that they want to differentiate from others and that they see as crucial, then they might want to do it themselves. And, and which verticals are the most promising? Uh, well, I would say you know the the public venues where uh, or the venues where you have a an important component uh, of uh, uh, visitors or mm, you know uh, people that are not really sort of working there. And the least ones are you know areas where they are completely isolated, like you know minefields. And then you know then it's really difficult to see. Uh, how an operator, it, it, it might work, but th th they might be more likely to do themselves. Okay, all right, great. Sean, I know we've talked a little bit already about 802.11ac and Hotspot 2.0, but how will these impact the demand for, for Wi-Fi as a service? Uh, well, it's going to have um, um, tremendous impact. Uh, multi, What I mentioned before with multi-user MIMO, the ability to service more devices um, in a network. I mean, how many times have you been to a location and your your device is, is no longer getting any um, communication with the internet, so you turn your Wi-Fi off? Um, Multi-user MIMO will be able to service four times as many devices, and then not only that, be able to focus um, on uh, things like video or screen sharing or video games. I mean, think of the explosion of <laughs> think of the explosion of of gaming as a sport. Um, I don't know if anyone's um, had the opportunity to to work with um, customers that are putting on these 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 massive events at stadiums where uh, they're having a video game a world championship and everyone in the stadium is connected Wi-Fi and they're all you know meerkatting and 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 periscoping and, and sharing video and, and the massive demand that is on the Wi-Fi network uh, to not only service dozens and hundreds of devices, but we're talking about dozens and hundreds of devices that are, um, you know, application, uh, not I want to say hogs, but, um, you know, bandwidth, uh, bandwidth heavy. And we, we're going to also see a tremendous uh, leap forward with 802.11ax, um, um, but for the, short, uh, for the short period, just being able to service more clients, give the attention to those that are demanding um, uh, high bandwidth through, through video or through video games, 
uh, that, that, that's probably where we're going to see the impacts of Wi-Fi as a service. I, I also want to say, as far as verticals go, hospitals. We work with a lot of medical device companies. If you think about it, patient monitoring is kind of like a voice call. It's yeah. a small um, amount of bandwidth, but is very impacted by latency. Uh, so that's another vertical where I've seen a lot of leadership, once again, on the device side, to be able to have patient monitors that can stay connected to the network under very challenging conditions, many, many, many wireless devices, also be very um, efficient with power. Uh, so I just also wanted to add to that as another vertical that I'm seeing a lot of great things from. Okay, yeah, we do hear a lot about the hospital vertical. All right, so the last question is maybe one of the most important. Wi-Fi as a service, can it create new revenue models for carriers? Monica touched on this a little bit, but Monica, I'd like to ask you if you have anything else to add and then just see if anyone else has anything to, to add on this question because we, we do hear a lot about things like location-based services as ideas, but we don't see a lot of that actually happening yet. Uh, well, yeah, I think that there, is, there is an opportunity as you deploy Wi-Fi um, in, uh, in uh, public venues, so you know, for instance, uh, um, a lot about the locations of your subscribers, uh, of your users, what they're doing, where they're moving around. So that's a, a revenue opportunity provided that you are able to, to use that information in a way that doesn't uh, uh, affect, that doesn't create uh, security concerns and, uh, um, you know, obviously all the advertisement location-based uh, or uh, services that are tied to location can bring additional revenues, I think. Does anybody else have anything to add on revenue models before we conclude? Uh, this is Bob Gazda. I'll just add is, is we do see in, in the, the Wi-Fi as an opportunity to support advertising, sponsored connectivity, premium Wi-Fi upsells, and even micro, small uh, subscription campaign types of management where, uh, um, you know, uh, bandwidth uh, or bandwidth or plan offers are done at small management levels. Uh, and we're working to support those in our in our smart access manager client, which kind of fills the gap between when native clients will be available and what can be done now over the top. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you all. I'd like to thank all our panelists today. John Schneep, Senior VP of Product Management at Republic Wireless. Thanks for being here. Thanks a lot, Martha. Monica Paolini, it's always good to have you, founder of Sinzafili Consulting. Thanks, Marta. And Bob Gazda, Senior Director for Technology Development at InterDigital. Bob, thanks a lot for being on the webinar. You had a lot of great comments today. Thank you. And Sean Bioni, Wi-Fi Business Development at Ixia. Sean, we really appreciate your input today. It's been a great webinar. Thanks, Martha. Thank you all for joining us. This will conclude the webinar. <laughs>